Africa. It's got one-sixth of the world's population, and yet Sub-Saharan Africa uh, has 80% of its residents living uh, on less than $1.25 a day. So, um, yeah, this is a, it's, a, it's a place where a lot of people have spent a lot of time and effort trying to find solutions to its economic and social problems. Last year, uh, six students from the Columbia School of International uh, Policy went to Africa and uh, worked with the Malawi Ministry of Health to try and uh, help them improve their programs for uh, child malnutrition prevention. Uh, and so the, the workers would go out um, and visit children in their homes, take measurements, uh, write them down, uh, and if the children had malnutrition, then they would give them uh, what you see here, this uh, ready-to-use therapeutic food product, uh, and then they would take the forms that they collected and uh, report back uh, to the ministry. So uh, Sean and, uh, and his classmates, uh, these classmates from, uh, from, from Columbia, went uh, to the ministry and said, show us the, the data that you've collected from this project. And they came back with a pile of boxes filled with paper. And uh, the data was locked up on, the, on paper in these boxes. And this was really an epic fail. There's no way you can act on information that's collected this way. So uh, malnutrition prevention, yeah. So this is a map of the internet, and uh, you'll notice that Africa is not very well represented on it. And so this pile of boxes is begging for a technical solution, and the internet is not the right place to find that solution, because less than 1% of people in Africa have access to the internet. One, thing that Af uh, uh, one bit of information technology that Africans do have, however, is a cell phone. Uh, in fact, one in two approximately this year will have a cell phone. And, uh, you know, they're, they're $10 handsets, so you can't do GPRS, you can't do J2ME, but you can build applications using SMS. Um, so, so applications, internet applications, uh, followed this sort of paradigm where first we had CGI scripting where you did everything from scratch. And right about 2,000 people said, let's build one thing that does everything. And, uh, and then they later discovered that this was not flexible enough and moved to building uh, frameworks like Ruby on Rails. So uh, at UNICEF, uh, in the UNICEF Innovations Unit, we built a system called Rapid SMS um, that uh, was uh, offered sort of Twitter-like messaging from one user to another, data collection, uh, flexible form generation. You can see the whole thing is really quite beautiful. And then uh, uh, this past year, the uh, UNICEF and SIPA went out and tried this uh, Rapid SMS application to augment these projects. Uh, these development projects in Ethiopia and Malawi, and we learned four lessons. And the first one was that it worked. The second one was that uh, you cannot build these applications in a vacuum. Uh, the, the users get things wrong, uh, they try things that you never expect, and you have to send your developers out there to work with the users, uh, otherwise you won't be able to build an application that they'll actually use. The, the second big lesson that we learned is that you must prepare for failure. Uh, you must uh, write programs that accept flexible inputs, that allow people to, uh, that give people feedback, that allow people to resubmit uh, their reports, and, uh, and you need to be able to allow administrators to correct people's mistakes later on. And the third lesson is that uh, you need to build frameworks and not whole systems, right? Because every single place and every single project is going to be different and have different requirements, and you want to be able to abstract the generic aspects of each of those projects out into a framework where it can be used generally. Um, there are two other projects out there used for text messaging in Africa, Yushahidi and Frontline SMS. They're really quite popular. They're doing great things, and if I had another five minutes, I'd tell you all about them. I'll just say that they're awesome, and they weren't quite right for what we wanted to do at UNICEF. So we're building an application framework for building SMS applications called Rapid SMS. It's open source, it's built in Python, it uses Django, and uh, it's designed to do the heavy lifting of application development so that you can focus on building your SMS-based application. Uh, so this here is an example uh, of an uh, input-output type thing that we did uh, for a uh, Millennium Villages project pilot in Kenya, where at the top you can see the healthcare worker texts in some data about a child, and they get back uh, confirmation of the child's identity using a little code number and, and some instructions on what to do about it. And this provides immediate feedback. Uh, the, the, the healthcare workers get follow-up alerts so that they go and visit children, uh, follow up with them, and things don't fall through the cracks. Um, and this also provides, at a higher level, provides decision makers with you know, potential early warning of famine, and we do away with the great big boxes of paper. But I want to issue a reality check. I, uh, information technology projects have promised the moon for international development. They have not really delivered. We are merely hoping 
that if people are able to do their jobs, that this technology will help them make smarter decisions. We have a huge consortium of organizations uh, and companies, independent developers that are working on these open source projects uh, to try to improve them. We're looking to work also with local developers in Africa. Um, if you're interested in this at all, please go to the website, join the mailing list, check out the code, check out the documentation. Please feel free to contact me personally. I want to thank Sean Blasky from SEPA for his, uh, his help and support in writing this talk. And I want to thank you all very much for your time. Really appreciate it.